Okay. So a little bit of Australian context. So legionellosis is notifiable in every state and territory of Australia. We have about 340 cases per year, which equates to about 1.6 per 100,000 people. And there are equal numbers of waterborne Legionella pneumophila. Uh, and we also quite commonly get Legionella long beachy from, from soil. And they equate roughly to about 0.75 per 100,000 people. And that varies across the state. So in my state, South Australia, it's about 70-30 for long beachy. Uh, it's more common. Uh, it's the same the world over, I'm sure. Uh, in Australia, exposure is much, much greater than infection, uh, and infection is much, much greater than, uh, uh, than disease. In Australia, uh, cooling towers and spas are the most commonly identified cause uh, of outbreaks. We know that building water systems are a source of infections, uh, but they tend to be sporadic. We've only had two or three outbreaks associated with, with buildings, uh, and one of those occurred in about 1979, so not very common. The last one in, in 2013. Uh, we've had a few less common sources. Um, so about 2008, we had seven cases associated with a car wash. We've had uh, occasional cases associated with ice machines and chilled water dispensers. Uh, in terms of regulation, an important uh, point is that uh, regulation is a state and territory issue. It's not a national issue. And that's the same uh, with water in general. Uh, so this is legionellosis over the last 20 years um, uh, in Australia. Uh, so the, the top line is uh, total cases. Uh, and then the, uh, the bottom line, um, Legionella pneumophila. Uh, that was uh, an outbreak in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne Aquarium, over 120 cases. Um, and then a smaller peak in 2013. Um, that, that occurred uh, because of an outbreak uh, in, a, in a hospital in Queensland. Um, only a very small outbreak, two cases, uh, but it led to a lot uh, of increased testing. Uh, so we picked up some more cases. Uh, again, for context, uh, um, for Legionella apply to, to building and manufactured device owners or operators. They, they don't apply to drinking water suppliers. We do not have uh, Legionella um, guideline value in, in our drinking water, uh, for our drinking water. Uh, the design and scope of regulations varies between jurisdictions. The regulations are, are generally administered by state health agencies in partnership uh, with local government. Um, but in some cases, safe work agencies play a role, particularly uh, in regulating cooling towers. And that's not unheard of uh, around the world. Uh, the focus of our regulations have been Cutting in and out a little bit. Sorry? You're cutting in and out a little bit um, every once in a while, but it's okay. Keep going. Did it, um, high risk, but generally regulated under uh, recreational water legislation. There's been a recent move to, to risk-based assessments of potential sources of Legionella, uh, particularly in hospital and aged care facilities. Our regulations <coughs> are informed by national standards and guidance. Uh, and again, this is the same um, in Australia as uh, occurs for drinking water and recycled water. So we, we have the national documents uh, from which we frame our regulations. So the most recent one is from NHealth, which, is, uh, which are guidelines for Legionella. Two standards that deal with testing, both by culture. Um, one, uh, just an old standard assay 
not not particularly sensitive uh, detection limit of, of one uh, per, per 10 mil uh, and then a more recent one uh, where we examine after concentration and then finally an Australian New Zealand standard on air handling and water systems of buildings um, gives a little bit information on water systems but the focus is on is on cooling towers so the general features of our regulations, and, and this is pretty common Australia-wide. So there's a general requirement for implementation of risk management plans. Again, it's the same for drinking water and recycled. Monitoring for Legionella occurs, but it's not a focus of day-to-day -day management. And look, you, you, I think we all understand the, the, the shortcomings of the long testing for Legionella. Our preference is to implement ongoing operational monitoring. So you know, chlorine residuals and temperatures in water distribution systems, uh, cleanliness and biocide dosing of cooling towers, you know, all pretty standard stuff. Uh, the questions about the value of Legionella and, and heterotrophic colony count uh, testing are reflected uh, by variable testing requirements across the state. So cooling towers. Uh, generally, most jurisdictions, cooling towers need to be registered. Uh, typical requirements in the legislation include continuous biocide dosing, fitting of fifth eliminators, uh, regular servicing, uh, and regular cleaning programs. And all of these need to be documented in a risk management plan. In some states, we have mandatory inspections and audits required. And then reports have to go to the regulator. There are requirements for Legionella testing uh, in a number of the jurisdictions, but these can range from monthly for high risk systems to quarterly, six monthly or annual audit testing. All of these are by culture. Monitoring can be mandatory or in a few cases recommended. Uh, some states also require or recommend uh, monthly uh, uh, HCC testing. The regulatory limits uh, for Legionella and HCC are set by the Australian standard or the ones that are in, that are in the Australian standard are the ones that are adopted. So there are three levels not detected, which is Uh, and then do more testing, two consecutive non-detects, um, <laughs> clear a tower, persistent detects can ramp up the disinfection and decontamination requirements. If you detected it greater than a thousand, um, then that leads to decontamination, which is a more uh, severe Clearer tower and persistent detects require further disinfection and decontamination. Uh, heterotrophic colony counts, similar. Uh, again, we've got ranges much higher now, of course, uh, less than 100,000. A similar, similar program uh, for Legionella, but just at much, much higher levels. Uh, notifications. Uh, notifications are usually specified uh, that uh, need to go to the public health regulator or to either the state health department or the or local government. They're typically based on the, the upper limits uh, specified in the Australian standard. So that is uh, 1,000, greater than 1,000 Legionella per mil or greater than 500,000 HCC per mil. Uh, some jurisdictions require notifications at lower levels. So, for example, um, 10 Legionella per mil or 100,000 um, uh, HCC per mil. That's less common. Uh, water distribution systems. Um, hospitals and healthcare. Uh, facilities. 
Uh, we've typically adopt, adopted two approaches. One is to regulate warm water systems. This is the older, more traditional approach. Uh, so these systems circulate water at no more than because the relatively higher risk to, for supporting Legionella growth. Uh, the newer approach is to regulate all water systems. So based on a risk assessment to identify potential sources of Legionella. So with the newer approach, we're bringing in uh, total building assessments. So we're looking at cold and hot water, uh, cold and hot systems, warm water systems, fountains, ice machines, chilled water dispensers. Uh, and this all systems approach is, is relatively new, is based on the in health guidelines. The warm water systems, clearly high risk uh, due to the temperature profile. Um, they, they were very popular at one stage. They were introduced in hospitals and aged care to reduce scalding risks uh, while having minimal temper, tempering control. Sorry? Can you still yeah, hear can, me? Um, can you, yeah, sorry, David, that's so many online. Can you all mute your, your uh, lines if you're not speaking? Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead, David. Tempering control. So the idea was you'd have the tempering control basically at the inlet to the hot water system. You'd reduce the temperature to 45 the whole system would be operated at 45 degrees. Um, it seemed easier and probably cheaper, um, but the popularity of those is waning a bit because of high Legionella control requirements. So we're seeing sixty degrees and then have tempering devices uh, on the individual bathrooms. Uh, risk management for warm water systems based on maintaining and monitoring temperatures, monitoring disinfectant residuals, minimising potential stagnation and dead legs and ensuring that, that water flows are maintained. Again, all standard, uh, standard uh, methods. Uh, other requirements, uh, so in my state, uh, we require six monthly high temperature or disinfectant decontamination. Our standards have now changed. Um, we now talk about disinfectant decontamination. Um, in the vast majority of cases, that means chlorine. Uh, so chlorine is very popular. Uh, Legionella monitoring is less frequent than it is for cooling towers. Again, uh, most states require um, immediate notification uh, when we uh, trip the, the limit uh, for Legionella, which in warm water systems is a detection. So if you detect Legionella in a warm water system, you have to tell the public health regulator. And you have to initiate immediate remedial responses, which generally take the form of disinfection um, or uh, a 70 degree uh, pasteurization uh, with follow up testing. And while that, all that's being done, exposure to contaminated aerosols is minimised until completion of decontamination. So what that means is uh, a, a wing, a ward, uh, rooms um, that may be shut down from using their showers uh, until the decontamination is complete. Okay, the general impact of regulations. The good side is that it's improved understanding of locations of high risk devices and systems. So we now have registers established for cooling towers. And in some cases we have registers for warm water systems. So the health regulators know where these systems are. We've improved communicating and re re communication and reporting networks uh, between operators, owners and regulators. And as a result of all this, our investigation of outbreaks and clusters of cases uh, have improved. That's all fairly qualitative. We don't have 
quantitative evidence on the impact of regulations. Uh, in Victoria, which were the first state to introduce uh, regulations, they had shown that, that the since in 2001, uh, there had been an increasing trend in Legionella pneumophila cases, and that peaked in, in 2000 due to the Melbourne aquarium outbreak. In the first two to three years, the regulations produced a decrease in the number of cases. Uh, this level has since been maintained or plateaued. Uh, we haven't seen much reduction in recent years. Uh, they also showed greater than a 50% reduction in the proportion of, of cooling towers testing positive for Legionella uh, following the introduction uh, of regulations. The challenges of regulating we've, we've encountered is that regulating building owners and owners of devices can be difficult. Legionella control not always seen as core business. It should be, but it isn't. Uh, and this includes in hospitals, uh, uh, which can be frustrating. Uh, and skills are often lacking. It's common for, for building owners to engage maintenance and water treatment companies and that, that can present a, a communication challenge because it adds additional management layers. I think one of the reasons that we've, we've tended to steer away from Legionella testing is that there's been a, a tendency to default to testing at the expense of operational monitoring. So we recently had a, a, a case uh, in a healthcare facility that had a really nice chlorination system uh, when we went in, um, the first question was about the chlorinator and the response was, yes, we've got this wonderful new system. It's got remote everything else. Unfortunately, when they went to check, it wasn't working properly and they hadn't been monitoring residuals, uh, even though their plan said that they would be doing this uh, regularly. So that's, that's been a difficulty. Future directions. Several jurisdictions are reviewing or will review regulations in the next one to two years. I think we are, as I said before, going to move to a broader assessment of buildings, uh, particularly in hospitals and aged care facilities. And there, we are considering increasing the monitoring for Legionella um, to, to get more information um, to support uh, what we're currently getting from our operational monitoring, from our audits, uh, to improve our assessment of risk. And that's my presentation. I hope I uh, answered the questions that you raised, or at least attempted to answer them. Yes, thank you, David. That was uh, that was good. Um, <clears throat> Well, uh, I think we can open up for questions from the, from all of us. Um, I had a quick question for you to start with. This um, limit on the 10 to the third, um, was that evidence or science-based or was it methodologically driven? No, it, it was viewed as, um, Are you thinking or did you cut out? <laughs> um, a little bit of both. Um, <laughs> it was based on the evidence of what, of what well-maintained cooling towers could produce um, and what we saw in, in poorly maintained towers. It wasn't based on, on risk of, of getting Legionnaire's disease. Um, in, okay. All right, uh, very good, than, thank you. Good. Yeah, if you've got really high numbers, you've got a higher risk. Right. Got it. Okay. Um, let's go around the table. Start with Chuck. David, uh, thank you. One of the things striking to me is it looks like your um, case rate for legionellosis in Australia has been pretty flat, whereas in the U.S. we show an increase. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, um, it, it has been flat. Uh, I agree. Um, and 
maybe that is one of the hidden successes of, of what we've been doing. It, it, I mean, it's, it's hard to know. Um, but if you take out those, <laughs> those two peaks, yeah, the, the, the rate has, has been pretty steady for 20 years. Any questions? Nick? So, David, um, I think we've had this discussion a little bit before, but for the benefit of everyone here, um, is there a, a, an idea to move forward to initial testing by qPCR as a way of just having a better finger on the pulse rather than just relying on culture, or is that not seen happening in any of the states? <coughs> oh, um uh, a little wary about the qPCR when we've done there's been some experimental work done on qPCR PCR and of course we detect we get a lot more hits uh, but we don't really know what they mean I mean uh, to an extent we don't completely know what the Legionella detects mean um, our research at the moment is probably going more to being more exacting in that space um, so a couple of the states are looking at programs for uh, whole genome sequencing. Um, we're getting some evidence of that we can drill down into the Legionella pneumophilus a bit, a bit more. Um, at one stage, we labelled all the pneumophilus serogroup group ones as uh, as the potential nasties. But you know, you all know that the evidence is is, is showing that um, it's only it's restricted strains, um, sequence types. So we're probably moving more in that direction. Hasn't been a big move to, uh, toward qPCR. Thank you. And I don't recall if there is a, a east-west differential in the sense of the dry west, the moist the east, or uh, north-south on the east coast in the sense of um, prevalence of legionellosis. Sorry, I lost you. Uh, East. Can you, uh, Nick, the microphone is right there. Sorry, I'll, I'll please please there. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully this is better, David. The question is, is there any apparent east-west with the dry west versus generally the wetter east in the incidence rates of legionellosis or north-south on the east coast? Um, Melbourne and Sydney have been traditionally our, our capitals of, uh, of, well, of clusters anyway. Um, and we, we think there's a bit of a climate issue, particularly in Melbourne. Um, our division is probably more north-south um, with Long Beachy. So Long Beachy is very common uh, in, the, in South Australia and, and WA. Thank you. Uh, Ruth. Yeah, I, I want to follow up on an earlier question um, about the initial decrease of cases and then some flattening of cases. And I'm thinking particularly of pneumophila now. And I wanted to know if there's been any variation in the trends by state and by regulation. Sure the David, did you hear the question? Yeah, I did. I did. Okay. Uh, there have there have been variations in the states. So the states do go up and down a little bit. Um, I've had a look at a couple of the states. Um, Victoria is is the one where they longest, and I, I I did mention that they did have an initial decrease and then it's flattened out. Um, they've probably They've been amongst the, the more active. Um, I'd have to, I have to go back and look at all the states, but my suspicion is that once we go into state by state, the numbers uh, will, will get smaller. So we'll tend to see a bit more scatter. Yeah, where I'm trying to get to is whether the states that have been more active in regulation have seen more flattening or, or decrease in their curve. You know, if, if, if the trend a little different from those that have been less active. Again, it may be, I think you're right, that the ones that are less active have fewer cases in the first place, but you still might be able to see trends if you lump some of those states together, if you will. 
most of us, uh, pretty well all of our states now have regulations. Um, and they either have it in straight legislation or they'll have it in a code of practice that's linked to their Public Health Act. Um, so um, all bar the Northern Territory have got some active, um, uh, active regulation um, of mostly cooling towers, uh, and, but now moving into the warm water systems. That, that, that tended to come second. Um, so I, it, at least in the last 10 years, you know, we've seen a, a reasonable amount of, of regulation. Increased slightly in Queensland more recently. I haven't looked closely at their figures. I can. I can get back to you. Um, uh, they moved into this uh, risk assessment of buildings approach uh, following an outbreak in a hospital in 2013. Uh, but... Uh, Victoria started in 2001, South Australia started in about 2008, um, and as I said, pretty much all the states are on board now. Thank you. Uh, David, Michelle has a question for you, and she's online. Go ahead, Michelle. Uh, hi, David. Um, hi, Michelle. I saw, hey, it's, yeah, it's nice to hear you. Uh, I saw one of your slides with a 45 degree um, recycled temperature goal. I, I thought that was a bit higher in some of the guidance I've been looking at. Did I read that wrong? It's in the middle of your presentation. Yeah, 45 degrees. Um, that's the temperature uh, for to be delivered in bathrooms um, in where you've got vulnerable vulnerable patients. Um, and young children. So, no, the 45 degrees is right. In homes, it's five so it degrees is. higher. Okay, and it is in the recycle, not at the point of use with a thermostatic or mixing valve, right? Ah, yeah, that's um, the warm water systems. It's predominantly, uh, the, the, most of the systems at 45. Um, and that was cost cutting because they could put one tempering device on the start of the system so they only had to have one tempering device and then circulate it all at 45. Um, we prefer the five degrees and have a thermostatic mixing valve on each and every bathroom and there is a movement that way because the uh, there's a false economy in in the 45 degree systems because they're a lot harder to maintain. What was the number you stated uh, before, David? It was, uh, you cut out when you were, what was the temperature? It's 45 degrees in the warm water system, but we prefer that they operate at 55 to 60 uh, and then have thermostatic mixing valves on the bathrooms, the individual bathrooms. Okay. Um, Thank you. Uh, I have uh, two other questions for you. One, uh, do you have any idea of the com community acquired burden in Australia with these uh, hot water systems? Also, these just this cold water that like, can reach 40 degrees in some households. Do you have any any data on that for Australia? In houses. Um, in, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Legally, under the plumbing code, if they have a storage, they're meant to maintain the storage at 60 degrees. But all the storages have, uh, the ones with permanent storages, they all just have a little dial and the householder can turn them up or down. So um, we're... Uh, but we haven't done a lot of work in that space. My last and third, my third and last question. Um, I, I really liked your your uh, bullet about the 50% reduction after the introduction of regulations in the state of Victoria for cooling towers. So uh, they, the numbers of positive or high level Legionella positive towers went down. Do you have any reports or statistics uh, for Victoria or other states that would help us understand that? Because um, 
Um, Germany has uh, statistics that we hope to acquire, and it would be nice to have some from mm -hmm. Australia. Yeah, I'll see if I can get it from our Victorian colleagues. They, they did publish some data um, in about 2008-2009, uh, which dealt with the first seven Um, and so I can get that, and I can see if I can uh, can get an update. They they used to publish it on their website every year, but they they stopped doing it. Um, but I, I should be able to get that for you. Thank you very much. Okay, Steve Van Roo. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for the nice presentation. Um, just a question about um, testing in the community. You know, um, regional urinary antigens sort of available in some places and not others. Um, culture or methodology is, is varied amongst different institutions. Do you have a sense of availability of uh, or access to the culture versus um, standard treatment um, that's given in communities? Do you guys have a sense of what that looks like? Because I would imagine throughout Australia, that's got to vary quite substantially. It might affect um, identification of cases. Sorry, Did you hear I, I, that, David? He's asking about the diagnostics for um, the population and yep. culture versus um, some of the newer methods and then how, uh, what they're doing about treatment, right, in the general population. Right, testing of patients, right, testing, Steve? Testing versus sort of empiric therapy. Is the term. Oh, it's testing versus identity. empiric, okay, okay, empiric therapy, okay. Um, well, testing is, is pretty standard. Um, um, antibody testing um, and culture when we can. Um, we try to encourage so testing of patients um, when it's community-acquired pneumonia. It does vary a little, uh, and I think... I alluded to that with the 2013 peak um, that you saw. That was associated with the report from Queensland um, of cases in a hospital. So there is some evidence that testing did increase then. Um, but certainly in, in my state in South Australia, um, we're, we're pretty keen when it's community acquired pneumonia to, to test for Yeah, I think in, in major hospitals, that's, that's more likely, um, less like uh, there could be gaps uh, once you move away from those. Uh, but I haven't looked at the stats on that one. So David, is there an underestimation of sporadic cases of uh, pneumonia associated with Legionella because of the lack of testing if an individual comes in with, with uh, respiratory disease or pneumonia? Yeah, I, I, is there an I, underestimation? Yeah, I think there's likely to be an underestimation. <clears throat> I'm going to ask everybody to pause just for one minute and ask all the committee members if they can turn off the Wi-Fi on their computers, if they have their computer or phones, and anyone in the room who's connected to the Wi-Fi, if you can please disconnect, because we think that this audio cutout is only affecting us. So if we can get all of us off the Wi-Fi and devote the signal to the speaker, I think we'll have less problems with audio. So if you were on the visitor network, if you could just disconnect. Get off. Get off the network. Um, yeah, I'm not on your, your phone might have automatically connected if you could take oh. that off, too. I'll make sure. um, we'll just, we're, just, we're just trying this out, David, because I don't think that anybody online is having problems hearing you, just us, uh, presumably because of the room we're in. So, okay, carry on. All right, um, uh, Ruth, you had a follow-up question. Yes, you mentioned that you thought there was a lack of education or a lack of knowledge uh, or ownership by the building owners and owners of devices. And I'm wondering what is being done about education of, of people who, you know, building owners and people who own these devices, anything? Um, 
Yeah, so we, we, we talk to we talk to infection control teams, we talk to the hospital engineers, we try and hold um, regular education sessions. Um, but it, you know, it, it is uh, a challenge. Um, the hospital folk love to test um, because that's, you know, that's what the clinicians like to do. Um, so if we talk to them about Legionnaire's disease and Legionella, they, they go off and do more testing for Legionella. Um, at the aged care facilities, um, probably more challenging. We've got more of a mixture of public and private in those spaces. Um, so we do continually try and, and, and put out educational material, give presentations, workshops, seminars, whatever we can do. Um, uh, Anything with hotels or large, other large buildings outside the healthcare system? We're not looking at hotels in, in, um, in much detail. Uh, we're moving to the, um, to the health and, and aged care facility. Um, that's probably more where we saw the warm water systems in the first place. Uh, yeah. Hotels get picked up if they've got a cooling tower. Great, thank you. Um, David, what happened at the aquarium? What, what, how'd that outbreak happen? A cooling tower and really bad really? management. <laughs> Okay. All right. Amy's got a oh, uh, Amy has a question. Amy? So I'm really intrigued by the Long Beach EA, and I think many folks in the scientific community are. So I'm curious some insight into if there's more variation than that, if, uh, if it's, and especially in the testing, has that open focus to broader testing beyond pneumophila or even within pneumophila, the different sera groups. You mentioned that you focus mainly on culture. And um, so I guess I'd like to hear a little bit of, um, if you're looking broader at different sera groups um, and, and what's, what's the general practice and what are the, the requirements? I'd also like to hear more about why you shied away from qPCR because you were cutting out on that part. Okay, so I mean, I stand that, test David? Is, is okay. Yes, yeah, I heard all of that. Um, so okay, the standard great. testing is standard testing is for pneumophilus here, group one, and and two to fourteen using the standard commercial kits. Um, if if we don't get a hit on those, then we do other speciation. We don't pick up a lot. We pick up the occasional McDaddy eye. Um, and of course, we do pick up Long Beach sheep um, because we're aware of it uh, and it's, it's so common. Uh, so we pick that up. Um, yes, we are looking, uh, we, we do want to do more work on uh, looking at, at sequence types. Um, so we've started some work with whole genome testing, uh, and let's. Um, so we're going back to look at some, uh, look at those. We want to have a better understanding of the distri distributions of sequence types um, in uh, environmental samples versus clinical samples. So we're doing more work in that space. I think in terms of qPCR, um, there's a general reticence in Australia about qPCR um, because of the, you know, the lack, uh, the, the, we move further away from, you know, culturability, viability. Uh, and I think there's a general, um, there's a general lack of confidence. Um, oh, sorry. There's a concern about the increased uncertainty using PCR versus culture. 
and and that's not just for Legionella. There's, but there's no um, study right now to compare, um, you know, in a building or seasonally, the numbers between a qPCR method and a culture method that you know of in Australia. Hello. We lost you, David. Yeah, I think so. You should log back in. I'm back. Maybe we'll ask him. Okay, you're back. Oh, very good. <laughs> we thought after that question, you just like, oh, sorry, got disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I just, no, I'm just asking just if you know out. of any study. No side by sides that I'm aware of. Uh, people tend to use one or one or the other. Um, uh -huh. Yeah. So there is a maybe it's an Australian thing. Um, we like culture, um, and as I said before, it's not just Legionella. Um, we we generally like culture when we can. Uh, there. Mm -hmm. yeah, there is an uns people feel less comfortable with the uncertainty associated with, with the PCR. Um, about the only place we are seeing increase in, in PCR and where, where of course it works really well is in clinical samples. Right. <clears throat> so you're moving to the, the PCR methodology in clinical samples. Oh, and yeah. and you're are you moving to the primer set that gives you um, Sero group one specifically, or are you just are you using um, just a, a genus based primer set? Um, at the moment, we're just doing Pneumophila. Uh, sorry, we're focusing on with with with, with the PCR. Sorry, that isn't really uh, so much a Legionella thing. That's, that's more with our cryptos, our salmonella. Uh, we, we're using the standard. For Legionella, we're using the, the, the standard method, methodology of, of the serum antibodies, the urinary antigen, and then culture and, and using standard methods. We're not using PCR so much for uh, clinical Legionella. Sorry, I misled you on that. Okay, all right, thank you. Now, David, I wanted to um, uh, summarize because you, you said that um, you would get us access and you can either give us the links, you can send it to me and Laura or just Laura or just me. I think the links to these reports that you mentioned, or you can send the report. I think you mentioned the um, a report or some of the data from, was it New South Wales? Investigation? Victoria. Oh, Victoria, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then are there other reports? We're looking specifically for environmental monitoring during outbreaks um, in comparison to routine monitoring data sets. And um, whether there's any reports that you have that during key outbreaks they went in and monitored and found certain numbers or certain percentage of samples positive. Okay, we've, we've certainly done quite a lot of investigations associated with clusters. Um, and some of those have been reported, but not along those lines, not in terms of um, a lot more. What our investigations tend to be to try and identify the source um, and uh, and not characterize the source once you found it. So less Price characterization and more more just identification of what the source is. Yeah, is more identification. Right? Yeah, more identification of the source and then nuking the source if we can. Um, we don't find the source in most most of our investigations. Um, for your for your cases, you don't you don't find what's 
what the source is. Okay. No, we don't. Um, most of our cases are, are sporadic. We do have the occasional outbreaks. We do occasionally detect the source, the Wesley Hospital, the Melbourne Aquarium. Um, generally, we don't find the source. Um, so we do a sweep. We'll find some, we'll find positives, particularly cooling towers. Um, uh, but we, we generally don't find the source of the outbreak. Okay, thank you. Uh, there, um, yeah, I can there get you some, sorry, I can get you some papers of, uh, I mean, there have been uh, some publications on source investigations. Uh, so I can, I'll, I'll see what I can find and, and send them to you. That'd be great. That'd be terrific. Any time? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm Ken Mortensen, just so you know, um, from the Alliance, I'm here for Darren, just, just so you know who it is. Uh, my question was around uh, potable water systems. Um, since you're at a kind of a baseline level on cases, um, are there chlorine residual regulations at all throughout Australia? Do they vary by state? And are there any considerations for additional uh, work there in terms of systems? Uh, David, did you hear that question? Uh, yeah, the question it? about chlorine residual. Yeah, chlorine residuals in um, potable water, does it vary by state? And what are the current thinkings and the future right, thinkings right. in that regard? Okay. We don't have a minimum requirement. It, it does vary. One thing we do do is um, we chloraminate in, in uh, three states, including my own. So um, you were cutting out a bit. So if I understand, you said uh, it varies state to state, and not all states require a chlorine residual in the potable water. Is that correct? Uh, we don't have regulations for chlorine residuals at end of tap in any state. But we do have chloramination in some states. Three states have chloramination. Um, one thing that does happen is... Uh, a number of hospitals um, add their own chlorine. So they have booster chlorination. And that's not just for Legionella. Uh, it, it's, it's also for other opportunistics as well. Um, so we do have examples of that occurring. Uh, but we do not have a requirement that a minimum chlorine residual of 0.2 to 0.5, for example, would be introduced to the customer tap. That is a goal that some of the utilities um, have set themselves, but it is not regulated. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chuck, you have a follow-up question? Yeah, David, when the hospitals add their own chlorine, are they subject to the regulatory oversight of the state drinking water program? Again, that, that varies, but um, in my state, yes. Okay. So if you're a hospital in South Australia and you add chlorine, you become a drinking water provider. And I've had a discussion with Joe Cotruvo on this uh, in the past. <laughs> we're very cognizant of not um, uh, of putting too many back. The hospital adds chlorine. Say again, just need to say again David, us. you cut out. David, could okay, you just start sorry. over? You cut out a little bit. Okay. If a hospital adds chlorine, they have to register with uh, my department as a drinking water provider, but their only requirements are that they register and that they monitor the residual, and if they put in too much chlorine, they notify us. That's it. Okay, so minimal, uh, minimal burden in terms of the hospital's requirement. 
That's right. We wanted to keep it as, as small as possible. Um, yeah, to me, to us, it made sense. If they've got a chlorine eddy, you should measure chlorine residual. Um, so Other? Yeah, Ruth? So what's the residual at which you ask them to notify you? Five. Are they required to have an engineer in the hospital that is is uh, overseeing that, or what about the training of the personnel? Yes. So most of our big hospitals uh, hire contractors, and they hire water treatment professionals to do it. Okay. Okay. Other other comments or questions? I think we grilled David. David, is it nighttime where you are? Is yeah. it time to go to sleep? Are you sitting there with a beer? <laughs> it's, it's exactly 12 hours on. <laughs> oh my goodness. There you go. Well, we appreciate it. Um, this is very useful and very helpful. And I will follow up with you on these uh, links to these other reports. Okay, and look, I'm, I'm sorry about the crackly line. If anybody's got any other questions, please just, just send them to me and I'll try and answer them. All right. That's Thank you. Good. Thank, Thank you, you so much.